Welcome to this week's edition of Wake Up the Echoes presented by TireRack.com. I'm your host, Tony Simeone. So excited to have you for this week's edition. We have a chance to talk about that 58-7 to victory over Pittsburgh. All three phases were cooking on Saturday, offense, defense, and special teams. As always, we talked to the head coach, Marcus Freeman, about what he liked and how he's excited for the Clemson game coming up next week. Talk to a couple defensive guys again. Have to keep co- talking to the defense. They've been absolutely lights out. Ten takeaways over the last two games. J.D. Bertrand, veteran linebacker, and then Jaden Mickey, who, of course, had the pick six. It was great to pick their brains and talk about what's been working on the defensive side of the ball with them. Finally, had a chance to catch up with one of my favorite guests we've had so far this year because I work with him every Saturday. That's Paul Burmeister, who's the voice of Notre Dame football on the radio. I'm telling you, if you don't watch the games, you can't watch the games for some reason, the radio broadcast with Paul and Ryan is outstanding. I would never say to mute the TV, but if for some reason your audio doesn't work, those are the guys you got to listen to. It was great to talk to Paul about his impressions. If you didn't know, he played quarterback at Iowa, so he knows the game at a high level, knows a lot about how this team is functioning on offense and defense, and then had a chance to really dig into his broadcasting career. He's going to be uh, calling a couple of football games on TV over the course of the next two weeks, so that allows actually myself to fill in for him when he's uh, on the road for the Clemson game. So Paul's a great discussion. Coach Freeman is always a great discussion, and the two defensive guys were great to talk to as well. Let's not waste any time. Let's get to the show. All right, Coach, here we are. Eighth episode. Only got three more of these left, so I'm going to savor these yeah. final few weeks with you. It's going uh, by fast. It's, it is going by fast. Yeah. Season's gone by fast. It I has. can't believe there's only three games left. It's nuts, man. It's crazy. This uh, was an emphatic win. I, I want to know just right out of the shoot, how pleased were you with the overall performance? I mean, 58-7 to seven kind of speaks for itself, but I thought your team was really complete in all three phases. Just what was your biggest takeaway? Yeah, I think there there was a lot of positives on all three phases, mm-hmm. right? Defensively to hold that offense to zero points really until the fourth quarter. Um, man, that was a, a great job of executing the game plan and to have four takeaways on defense. I mean, they're, they're just continuing to be in the right place and then make the plays when they come to them. And offensively, you know, we really ended up having about 38 points um, on offense, which I think Pitt was averaging 20-something points given up and 500-plus yards we, we had on them. And, and, you know, to see them respond after the first two interceptions on the first two drives um, w- was really great to see. You know, I challenged them at halftime, and they came out second half flying, and uh, it was great. And then special teams-wise, 14 more points, right? We had seven last week uh, or the versus USC, and for them to, to, to really contribute 14 points to the overall score, um, that, that third phase is really making an impact. I wanted to ask you about the response after the two picks because I thought the offense was moving the ball well. They were. The picks were a little uncharacteristic. Maybe there was one that should have been called for a penalty. We won't get into the, the pass interference. I, I, I'll say it so you don't have to worry about getting <laughs> fined. But what what are the conversations like? Like when Sam comes to the sideline, when, mm-hmm. do, you, do you talk to the quarterback? Is it all him and Gino and, and Coach Parker on headset? And what do you see from him? Because he seemed really poised and there was no panic and it was fine after yeah. that. That's Sam Hartman, man. He is uh, so consistent in his approach. He's He's been through a lot, right, six years of this. And trust me, he's thrown two interceptions before. And he sometimes he kind of looks at you like, I'm good. I'm good. And I know it, right? I, I spent a lot of time with Sam. And, you know, a lot of times interceptions aren't always the fault of the quarterback. Sure. You know, and, and one, the very first one, that safety made a heck of a play. And did he pull him or not? It doesn't matter. Like, that's not on Sam Hartman. He put the ball exactly where he needed to be. And – uh I want him to continue to be aggressive, you know. And the second one is is a little bit on coaches on him, that it, that you know we obviously got to do a little bit better job of selling a fake to get that backer to come up a little bit. But you know he's so consistent. He comes back out there and throws a big play, and we go down the field and score. And that's what I expect out of Sam Hartman, a six year mm-hmm. experienced quarterback, and um, he he did a tremendous job defensively. I'm going to talk about the defense for a while here. Xavier with two more picks, but also what stood out to me is he was around the ball a lot otherwise, mm-hmm. too. He's making big tackles for you. What are you seeing in his game? You know, the highlights jump out to the everyday fan, but from a coaching staff, what are you seeing from Xavier that's just allowed him to go to the next level in, in a complete defensive performance? Yeah, I mean, everybody will point to the interceptions, which are huge, right? And, and you know, those those two interceptions that he had on Saturday, he did a good job of, 
catching the ball when it came to him, right? <laughs> right. But you got to be in the right position, and then you got to make the play. I was so pleased with the way he tracked the ball and and, and tackled. Um, that to me is so impressive. You know, he did a great job of closing space um, and being physical at the point of contact. Now you're seeing a complete safety. Mm -hmm. You know, he is just continuing to get better and better. Um, now you're getting the stats, you're getting the, the takeaways, you're getting all these things that come along with it. But what I see is a guy that is just getting better and better at this position. The term uh, coverage sack is one I hear a lot of time, right? The DBs are covering and allows you to get a sack. Those picks, though, I, I haven't heard this a lot. I'm going to try. Maybe it's my own idea. I don't know. Pressure pick. I like that. I thought the guys like up that. front created yeah. the picks, or they at least were really instrumental yeah. in creating the picks. The, the guys up front, I think, are, are peaking right now. R Riley Mills, Howard Cross. What have you seen from the guys up front? Because we're talking about the secondary because they're taking the ball away. But I feel like it's being caused a lot by the, the big boys up front. Yeah, 100%. As you go back and you watch a lot of those takeaways, you'll see his guys affecting the quarterback. Yeah, there's some that are through coverage and, and pre-snap tells, and Jaden Mickey's was a great job of knowing, hey, if the quarterback looks this way, he's going to throw it to number two because it's happened twice in the game before, mm -hmm. uh, twice in that same game. He The first one he missed, the second one it was a, a PBU, and this one he stole it and, and scored. But a couple of those other interceptions, man, what you see is that the ability for our guys up front to truly affect the quarterback's arm. We teach that, not just to get there and hit the quarterback, but to truly match his hand and, and affect his throwing arm. That causes a forward quarterback not to be able to finish through mm -hmm. and follow through. And so those are, are truly pressure picks. Um you know, and it's a, a major credit to our D-line. Pressure picks. We're going with I that. like that. Uh, I want to talk about Jaden Mickey and his pick six because I was listening to the radio broadcast and give our guy Ryan Harris a shout out. Yep. The first one that he missed, I think it went for maybe like a 15-yard mm -hmm. gain or something like that. He said, if I'm on the defensive staff, I'm telling him, keep doing that because you know it's coming. Yep. So you football guys are all over it. If I'm watching just and not listening, I'm thinking, oh, come on, you got to make that <laughs> pick, man. Why are you out of position? So when you see that on the sideline, what is the communication like? And then how satisfying was it to see him rewarded for sticking to the the plan you guys had going yeah. in? You know, we, we always say coach to fix, not the fault, right? And, and the natural reaction out of you is like, ah, oh, come on, make the play. That That's coaching the fault, right? And that the, the reality is coach to fix. How do you coach to fix is to understand, hey, we run this same pressure. No, if the quarterback's looking your way, they're going to take two to the flat, jump it. Don't try to PBU it, jump it and go make the play. And, and he, the second time I said was a PBU. Yeah. The third time ended up being a pick. And so the confidence that gives a young person when you say, hey, this is what you got to do to fix it. This is what you got to do to fix it. Be aggressive. The same thing you tell the offensive coordinator after the first shot that, that ends up being an interception is take another shot. Be aggressive. Like, that gives your players and your coaches confidence to go out and be aggressive. And that's the only way you're going to have success. You mm -hmm. cannot play this game passive um, and afraid to make a mistake. You have to be aggressive. Play this game with velocity, and, and that's what you see. I don't want to skip over the Christian Gray one-handed pick. Yeah. That was nice. The the secondary, I, it's kind of amazing they had this performance, and Benjamin Morrison wasn't in the lineup mm -hmm. that day. And Cam went out. And, and Cam yeah. went out late. That's yeah. right. I mean, so it tells you about the depth. I want to ask about Coach Mickens because <laughs> he's a guy you've known <laughs> for a long time. That room and Coach Mickens, I saw Jaden. We're going to talk to him later in the show. When I talked to him, he kind of lit up when I brought up Coach Mickens. What's the impact he's had on the secondary? Yeah, you know, the number one thing Coach Mix does is, is a lot. Of, he does a lot of things really well, but he's a great evaluator. He, uh, I told this story in a press conference that, you know, I wasn't standing on the table for Sauce Gardner at Cincinnati. Right. You know, and, and Coach Mickens said, this is the guy. And he was right, you know, and he's done that with these guys that we've brought into Notre Dame. And, and so he can evaluate talent, but then he develops that talent. And the only way you develop talent is through trust and through a connection you have with a coach. And, yes, he's played the position, but he also has a way to, to develop those guys and has that connection. And so he's getting that guy, that room to be one, unselfish, mm -hmm. right? Jaden Mickey shows you how good he is when he gets the opportunity. Same thing with Christian Gray. But – you have to create a, a culture of being unselfish and understanding that, hey, take advantage of your opportunities. Mm -hmm. That's all that matters. When you get the opportunity, take advantage of it. Um, but he also, he brings a schematic element to it too. He is uh, extremely knowledgeable. Um, he's a great developer of corners, but also of, of the passing game, passing defense. And uh, he's just continuing to just rise in, 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 in terms of the coaching profession. One last player I want to ask about. Everyone got involved this week. It was fun to see so many different guys. Is Steve Angeli? Mm -hmm. He's a guy that I've seen play in a couple spring games. He's gotten in. Steve. He got to really run the show though. There in the fourth. I thought the throw, the the touchdown throw across the body. That that is a very hard throw from everyone I've talked to that's yeah. played to get your hips around. 
Six of seven, 92 yards, touchdown. For a guy that's he's put in the work, he's done it, he's sat behind guys, and he's getting a chance to put it on film now, what does that mean when you see someone who's put in the work perform like that? Yeah, he is. Uh, um, and I'm not, I wish I could say I was surprised. Steve Angeli's a great player. He he just, again, is continuing just to get better and better, and he puts the work in in terms of his preparation. He knows at some point his number's going to be called, mm -hmm. right? And that could be through what happened Saturday or an injury. And we have full confidence in Steve Angeli going in the game and performing the way he did. Um, as you said, that throw, that touchdown throw, was 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 a lot more difficult than, than he made it look. And uh, but that's 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 a result of a lot of preparation, great coaching, and uh, a talented individual. Three games left. Talked about it a little bit earlier, and you're in this two game sprint. We talked mm -hmm. about it last week. You'll worry about what you got to do in next bye week when next bye week rolls around. You get a chance to go to Clemson. Have you ever been down yeah. to Clemson? So it's your first time down there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what's the prep like this week? You know it's going to be a hostile environment. Do you guys do anything different to prepare for that, or is it just business as usual when you get ready for a game like this? You know, I think you always prepare for an away game in terms of how you – on offense, how you want to do the cadence and the snap count. Um, you know, that's to me more than anything is, is important. But, you know, this, this challenge this week will be a one-week sprint to, to raise our level, right, to the next level. Our performance on Saturday is a result of our preparation. Our performance on Saturday is a result of a lot of guys understanding what to do, why to do it, and how to do it. Mm -hmm. And there's another level, though, and that's my challenge to them in this week in practice is that we got to find this next level as an individual. Every inner coach and player has to find this next level. Um, and if we do that, this team, the performance on Saturday will be at another level, and there is another level, mm -hmm. right? 58 to 7, doesn't matter. There's another level that this team can go to. And so that's the challenge I'm going to have for myself and our program um, and in terms of how we prepare. You know, you can think about how motivated Clemson's going to be now, yeah. right? Come off a tough loss, they're 4-4. Four and four. Um, Then you look at those four losses, the the one to Duke, you know, really was unique. They turned the ball over a couple times in the red zone. I mean, that, that game could have went either way. Two day loss in overtime and one. I mean, every statistical stat they pretty much won versus NC State and ended up losing the game by seven mm -hmm. because of, of a turnover. But – they're going to be motivated. Our challenge is to make sure that our practices are better than theirs. Like, that's my challenge to them, and, and that will take this program and our performance to another level. I know last week, I'll get you out of here on this, you you spent time doing the flag football game. What, what did you do this weekend? Was it just back to business? Back to business. You didn't take the kids out back and run no, through some plays and make no. sure they had two flags on? Too or? much film to watch. <laughs> too much film? Okay. Watched the game Saturday afterwards, ran home, grabbed something to eat, um, got a chance to watch a little bit of Ohio State-Wisconsin game, and then... Sunday, back to preparation, okay. get ready for Clemson. Evaluation of Saturday, um, and then preparation for, for Clemson. I'm excited to hear down the road what you do for the second bye week. We'll talk about it on our last show, okay? <laughs> All right. All right, thanks, Coach. Let's you get out of here bring a couple players. All on. right, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> this is our <clears throat> coldest moment of the week segment, just so you guys know. It's brought to you by Yeti, okay? okay. So I always ask uh, – the guys that are with us for the coldest moment from this past week or in their career. So we got Jaden Mickey, J.D. Bertrand. I think we know what Jaden's coldest moment of the week was this past week. You want to tell me, though, J.D., what you thought going through your head when you saw him make that pick six? I was excited. I mean, the biggest thing is, like, I think he had a similar play earlier on, and so mm -hmm. he knew if they came back with the same routes and same coverage, like, he was about to get it. And so I think all of us knew looking at on the sideline, like, if they came back to either corner with that same route, to like, same route concept, like, it was a pick six, and so he made it happen. Jaden, I saw the play. It was what, when was it? Was it first quarter, second quarter, where you went for the pick and didn't get it, but you were close? Oh yeah. What, when you went for that, were you thinking the next time I think, I'm going to do it? I think it happened in every quarter. Quarter. Um, <laughs> I think it was first or second quarter, and then it happened again coming out of halftime, and then I ended up getting it mm -hmm. the third time. So third one's a charm. Third one, third time was a charm. When was the last time you got into the end zone in your college in your football career? Uh. Probably a kick return or something in high school. Okay. So it feel pretty good. Yeah, it felt good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> uh what about JD? You've played with him now for a couple of years. What's the coldest moment that comes to mind when you think about playing with him? Um I always admire him fitting the gaps. Because hmm. as a linebacker, you know, you just sometimes you just gotta plug the gap and you gotta plug the gap with guards and tackles and they're three hundred pounds and you know, you're not so I always admire how good he is at plugging the gap, so okay. I always watch that. You said you admire him as a linebacker, so we've got to settle a debate. Cam Hart came here, gosh, maybe a month ago now. He said he thinks corner is the hardest position. He said he was harder than quarterback. Now, Coach Freeman mm. had a dis, you know, disagreement with him. <clears throat> Let's just talk defense. 
and you guys can debate this if you want. What's the hardest position on the defensive side of the ball? Throw corner out there. You think corner? Yeah. Okay, so you'll you'll give that up. To I'll corner. give it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, definitely just corners. technique why like they're just out there by themselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They don't have help versus everyone else. You have that second level, and we were talking about actually the other day, like me, Cam, a couple other guys, and we were saying like, well, what's the hardest part of your job? I think, mm. Were you in there for that? Uh, no. Okay, it was what's the hardest part of your job? And like DJ was saying, like that open field tackle when there's this past the first two levels and there's 20 yards of space and you got to get it down. Yeah. And Cam was saying like cover zero from like an apex position and now you got to go cover. And so we, we've had these discussions before and these debates and I think the all around answer might be corner. Yeah, it's definitely corner. And I'm happy <laughs> to agree with Cam on um, it's the hardest position on the football field. But okay. um, it's just it's a lot of things you have to do mentally and physically to prepare for the game and then to go out there everybody's watching your position whether it's you versus a receiver uh like like when ben went against marv everybody's eyes on marv yeah. and ben so everybody can see your mistakes everybody can see when you succeed as well so it, it's it's rewarding but it's risky as well so and he was saying too like you can play 70 good snaps but if you get beat on exactly. 71 and 72 that's all they're talking exactly. about right exactly one Oof. play it changed the entire game so i want to ask about um when you are in cover zero like you said like, do you get excited? Do you get nervous? If you know you're on an island, what goes through your head? See, honestly, I think this question has changed over my career here. Okay. Um, at first, you know, you get here, you're like, okay, cover zero. I have no help anywhere. It's me versus him. But then you, you think about the guys helping you blitzing. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, he got two, three, two and a half seconds to throw the ball. I just got to stop the dude for two and a half seconds, and this is where you make your play. So yeah. This is where you show up, cover zero, let's play ball. So, so your perspective changed. Yeah, it definitely did. I thought some of those picks that Xavier had this past week were created by the defensive line up front, right? You guys talk about that, how, you know, there's there's coverage sacks, yeah. right? And then yeah. there, I think there's also pressure picks. Did you get yeah. that sense? There's a big emphasis. Like, when we come in, I mean, I'm sure today when we go into the meeting room, like, as a whole unit, we watch, like, we watch all those picks, but we watch what are other guys doing? Right. What are they doing to help make that happen? Like, are guys putting their hands up in the quarterback's face? Like, are we getting hits on the quarterback? And just kind of being able to remind everyone, like, when we're looking at film, like, everyone has their role. And if someone's not doing their role, he's not getting his pick and the other four picks as well. So, Where's the vibe right now defensively? Because you guys have 10 takeaways in the last two weeks. I think you guys are playing about as good as good as you could play, right? Like, it's pretty yeah. close to perfect. I know you guys still want to keep reaching your potential. But, like, let's be real. Is the vibe pretty good in the defensive room right now? Yeah, I'd say it is. I mean, captain could talk more. (laughs) I mean, I think just when we step out on the field, like, we know that we can stop any team that's Mm -hmm. out there. And whether it's the Heisman winning quarterback from last year or just a good all-around team that has every single aspect that's to the top level, like, we really think that we can come out there and compete with every Mm -hmm. single team. So it's kind of funny because offense and defense, like, we're one team, but – almost like we just look at it a lot of times as a whole picture just okay defense like what can we do to win this game and we feel like we can take over the game defensively and so that's what we're trying to do obviously yeah to add on to what he said like I think our coaching staff whether it's coach Golden and for me coach Mickens has been preparing me as far as knowing knowing where your help is knowing what's around you yeah so like on my pick I know that blitz is coming off the edge. I know he has a, he's probably going to throw into a blitz. So things like that, preparing us throughout the week and just allowing us to be one unit on the football field, it's, it's been great. Coach Mickens, what's he like? What's it like to play for him? I love playing for Coach Mickens. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he, 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 he talks a lot of mess. That's what he said when he was, <laughs> when he was back in the day. So, And that's, that's a little bit what I do. So a lot of just talking. A yeah, a lot of talking, a lot of personality. But he loves to compete. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where we, we're closest is I hate to lose and I love to win. And it's the same with Coach Makers. I love playing for him. I think the rest of the DBs will say the same. Yeah. I want to ask you a different question, kind of shift a little bit. I know this has been a tough time for you and your family. I heard you talk about it with what your mom's going through. So I guess to the extent that you could share just how is she doing, what's going on with, with her, and and how did you feel this weekend when you got into the end zone? Because I know you mentioned her after the yeah. game. Yeah, I was just home this past um, bye week, spent a little time with her. Um, she's doing good. She's spending time with us, her family, you know, for whatever time she has left. Um, but it was it was fun getting to that end zone because mm-hmm. that's, that's what I've been, I've been 
waiting on like I want my mom to see me you know have this moment you know um whether it's down here or in heaven whatever it may be but I just couldn't wait for it and um that point to the sky also meant a lot to me too hmm. you know being able to glorify God on that stage and I pray before every game and one thing I say is here we are again Lord I've been saying this since high school this moment whether it comes to me or not I give it all to you and it was big I appreciate you sharing that. What's it been like to be on this team? How's this team, the staff, your teammates, have they helped you while it's been a tough time for you and your family? It's it's the culture. Um, you know, I know Coach Freeman says it all the time. Everybody says it about Notre Dame, it's the culture. Being around guys that are like-minded, um, want to succeed on and off the field. Um, you know, just being in a locker room full of good character guys, it's its helped me on and off the field. I, I want to ask you, J.D., because I think I talked to you last year about how you help in the community. I think this yeah. team does a great job of putting football in the right perspective. When you see what someone like Jaden's gone through, a teammate, what what, do you, what goes through your mind? What have you guys done as a team to try to rally around him or, or anybody that's yeah. gone through something tough? I, mean, I think the biggest thing is just how can we help? Like, mm-hmm. And some guys, some, guys, some guys need space. Some guys need us to step away. And But a lot of guys just want just to have that day-to-day interaction and just still be able to smile with the guys, still be able to mess around. And, like, I mean, this dude's in the locker room. We have a little basketball hoop. And, I swear, every single time I'm leaving the locker room, he's in there arguing with someone about if who's winning this game, who's winning that game, a knockout, and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, like, just kind of getting those spa- times where you kind of just step away and just be one of the guys and kind of, like, just make sure that you're having fun with your boys and those kind of things. And, right. I mean, I think he'd probably attest to that. Did you play basketball in high school? No. No? <laughs> but you still beat everybody in knockout? Yeah, just like to compete. Okay. <laughs> just like to compete. I got you. Yeah. Uh, I'll get you out of here, talk some football. Let's talk about this upcoming week. Obviously a huge game. You get a chance to go to one of the toughest environments in the country. I'll start with you, J.D., then we'll let Jaden get out of here. What's the key? What are you guys focused on as you get ready for Clemson? Yeah, I mean, obviously just Clemson in general. Like, there's always going to be that hype, and Mm -hmm. we're excited. And honestly, it's my first time going to Clemson. I think it makes basically everyone's first time Yeah, first time in eight years, yeah. Yeah, so everyone's excited for that part. But obviously it just goes back to us, I think. That's the biggest thing. And so looking at this last Pittsburgh game, looking at the game before that, like, where can we get better? And I think our coaches have done a great job coming off the bye week, like pointing out like, hey, like a lot of our scores have come from penalties. Like mm-hmm. let's make sure we don't beat Notre Dame. And so just those kind of things, make sure that like penalties at corner, like they're going to happen at times. Like you're going to miss jump for the ball, but the little things before the snap, like not jumping off the ball, not jumping off sides and those kind of things. And so how do we do that? Like it starts with practice. And so making sure that we're practicing the best possible and I mean, making sure that our practice, our Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday practice is better than Clemson's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday practice. What about you, Jaden? Yeah, like J.D. said, it's about us. Um, There's a lot of plays that were made this last Saturday, but there's a lot of plays left out there, and I got to do a better job. And I know there's probably other guys out there that know they have to do their job better at certain times. And I always say 100%ers got to be 100%ers. There's some things you have to do that are going to be 100%. You have to set the edge sometimes. You have to contain outside. You have to fit the gap a certain way every time, no matter what. So um, I think making sure that the 100 percenters are 100% and just building off that every day this week until Saturday. All right. I appreciate you coming by. We'll let you get out of here. We'll bring Coach Freeman in. All right. Got Coach Freeman here, a couple of linebackers, J.D. Bertrand. I have a trivia question. That's how we're going to start this. J.D., do you know how many tackles Coach Freeman had in 2007? Hmm. Do you know how many tackles you had in 2007? Can you know how many tackles you had in 2021? Uh, I hope you don't. Like, you don't keep stats. Okay, I got you with 102. Do you think you have more or less than 102? I give him more. No. No way. 109. Yeah, mm, duh. I should have known that. I, <laughs> you, huh? I think I had you. What, were you second team All America one of those years? I think I read. So. Uh, oh, yeah, no. We talk no, about no. Coach Freeman a lot, but we got to get some tape and talk about. No, him. we've yeah. seen the tape. Do you see the tape? Yet. No, Ooh, he's it's much pretty, better. Pretty big back then too. They threw up the yeah. tape. So you think JD is better linebacker than you were? He is. Okay. He is, uh, what makes him a better linebacker? Smarter. Hmm. Right. The way he prepares. Um, he's more physical. Now, I don't know if he was as athletic, but <laughs> those traits, I mean, that's what makes he's – I've never been around somebody that prepares the way he prepares. Mm-hmm. And I've told people, I use him all the time, like, that's the standard. Like, yeah. And very few, none have reached that other than him, but the preparation he puts into the game, that's why he's so successful, man. 
What do you like about having a head coach that was a linebacker? Is there anything about it that's good? Is it is it bad? I know it's that Mar- Maris said that <laughs> Maris said that he's all over him over you guys first. So maybe yeah. it's the the negative. But what what do you like? What do you dislike? I mean, there's some good and bad. I mean, <laughs> I think the good is like he's able to see the ball from like our perspective. Like he's able to kind of know things, what things are happening, what mistakes we're making before. I mean, almost times before we make them, but when we're coming off the field, like he knows why they scored, like what we can do at our position specifically to make sure that we're able to come back out the next series and be better. So he's always talking to you guys. Yeah. Still. Oh yeah. Yeah. He uh-huh. said he he said when he becomes the head coach, it's tough because he doesn't get to be a position coach. But I still get the sense like he's head coach and really still wants to be linebackers. Coach. Uh, no yeah. doubt. I'm always watching them. Uh-huh. You know, and part of it because you had a year where we were together, right? right. And that relationship will be different than any relationship I have with any other players on our team because I was their position coach for a year. But that's where my eyes go. Mm-hmm. You know, I love to – I watch their individual drills and I want to go and help, but I stay away. I just watch them from afar, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, critique in my own mind. It's like the gift. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah. Campbell Award. We talked about it before we started here, but you're up for it. I think you're the first Notre Dame player I heard since Drew Tranquil. Great example for this program. What did it mean to get nominated for that award? It's super special, and I think just – it's great to get the recognition, but there's also just been so many people along the way. I mean, even him, like, in our linebacker room, just ripping guys if we have some academic problems back in the day. And so, But there's just so many people along the way that have helped me. And so it's really cool, like, from the times when my mom used to make us sit and do flashcards on the way to practice and those kind of things. Just, like, it's cool to be able to see all those kind of things like shown in this award feels validating right exactly. like the, the work's paid off yeah. what's it mean to have someone in your locker room i mean you mentioned the kind of leader he is and, and the work he puts in but to see it recognized on a national level what does that mean to you you know it's it's a great example of the the total package right in that the same work jd puts into being a great football player he puts into the academics he puts into you know society mm-hmm. right and 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 giving back and and that's what I'm saying. He he's been blessed, right? He's uh, his parents get a lot of the credit, um, but you know he is. Uh, I mean, just a great example of of a guy that overachieves at everything he does in life, mm-hmm. and uh, he's going to be successful for a long time now. I wanted to ask you about JD's role on this defense as a player. I, I get I get the sense I've talked to him a couple times over the last few years, like he's a great leader. And then I've talked about the ten takeaways over the last two weeks. I don't you don't have a takeaway yourself, right? But he's very involved in why those takeaways come to be. What does he do for you guys defensively that lets you have lets the other guys have the success that shows up on the on the highlight tape? Just the consistency in his performance, right? Is is you know what you're gonna get out of J.D. Bertrand. You know what you're gonna get out of him in practice, and you know what you're gonna get out of him in Saturdays and, and he does a lot of things that, that might not be in the statistics book, but um, the ability to beat, like I love when I, I really appreciate the linebacker position, right? right? And I'm getting to a little bit of the technical side, but it's really difficult to beat blocks one on one, and it's a mentality, a mentality, but also fundamentals. And you'll watch JD play, and he the ability for him to beat blocks one on one, to take on another block, so somebody can make a tackle or to make the play himself is is just such a unique talent um, that that. It's really special. You know, the ability to make other people around you better. Yeah. You know, I'll use J.D. as an example for a long time as I I continue to coach, but probably one of the greatest traits he has is the ability to make those around him better. And um, that's by his play, but also challenging other people. And it's uh, it's something you can't take for granted. How do you develop a mindset that is selfless and can help others get better? Because one of the first things that you said when um, I'd asked him about Jaden's pick, because I could tell you genuinely were thrilled that Jaden got the pick, got the touchdown – you know, if some people, they play and they, they want the spotlight to themselves. And if you're going to be a middle linebacker, sometimes, like you said, it's, your play is going to make somebody else shine. How do you develop the right mindset so it's always team first and yeah. it's always the other guys who might get the attention? I mean, I think for me, like someone like Jaden, like I've been in his shoes before. And you come in and you think you're going to play right away. You think all these things are going to happen. You're going to, I would say like the Kyle Hamilton career, but then it doesn't happen. And the majority of guys, it doesn't happen. And so I've been there before. And so I've seen his gradual increasing growth and his gradual increasing development and just him continuing to get better and so when you see him make those big plays on the big stage like it's super exciting how do you okay this this brought up a topic that i'm really curious about because there's so many different careers right there's the kyle hamilton comes in day one boom 
and there's the guys that have to earn it every step of the way. I think as someone who's been around and has stuck it out, like Chris Tyree changed positions. Now he's thriving and punt return and wide receiver. I'll start with the coach, but like, how do you talk to the players? There's 110 guys that have 110 different paths mm-hmm. that it's probably not going the way they all wanted to, but there's still a way to make it work. How, how do you communicate that? Because it's, it's a tough, it's a tough, it's a bumpy road. As you That's said, right. it's a tough bumpy road to kind of navigate. That's probably one of the biggest challenges as a leader, as the head coach, is to get our players to understand every individual road is different. Mm -hmm. Every path, every journey is different. And you can't compare your journey to the man next to you, right? Your journey is different. It's your own individual journey. And and for some people, it's instant playing time. For some people, you might never play. That's the reality of it. But what you have to do is trust and work and put your head down and and not let things that really don't matter affect your journey. And it was easy. It's a lot easier for me to do that when I was playing college football. Hmm. We didn't, I don't even, social media just started yeah. coming around. You know, your parents would call and say, hey, how you doing? You know, it was almost like you were supposed to redshirt. You were supposed to take time. You would get a couple years, maybe at the end of your career. But now... Everybody compares their journey with the guys that come in and start right away, and that's not reality. And so my message is always a constant one of of trust your journey that you're supposed to be on. Don't let things sway you out of the middle of the road, right? Stay right in the middle of this bumpy road and know that this is exactly where you're supposed to be and know the ways to get better. Hmm. Not just be satisfied and content. There's ways to get better on this road, but don't make it be about the outcome, Hmm. right? And uh and and it's an everyday challenge. You can't just have that that conversation once and think that they all understand it. It's yeah. a daily conversation. How do you guys, players, handle that? Because like, I'm sure you got yeah. young linebackers that I'm sure want to play that are talented and they're behind certain guys, and you were a young linebacker. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that, yeah. that players have go through that. And you're a leader. How do you guys in the room discuss those topics and, and make sure everyone's in the best headspace they can be? I think as a young guy, you lean on the people, you lean on the coaches, and Coach Freeman always challenges us like. If you don't know why you're playing, like don't come to him initially. Come to your position coach. And then when you have that figured out, then you can go to him. But majority of the time, your position coach is going to shoot you straight and he's going to know exactly what you need to do to get better. And then they also lean on guys like us, like the older guys. And we've been through it, as I said. But like my thing was always like, how do I maximize myself so that if I never play here, I can say I did everything possible to be able to make sure that I could have played here. like, Or I could have did everything possible to make sure that I was able to reach my full potential as a person. And if that doesn't mean playing at Notre Dame, then it didn't mean playing at Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where I was. Last one for each of you guys. I'll start with you, JD. Just you're coming towards the end of this journey at Notre Dame. It's been a great time, I assume. I've talked to you a couple times. Your brother was here for a while. Just have you had a chance to reflect? And, and if you have, just what comes to mind? What do you think about when you think about your time at Notre Dame? Honestly, I feel like I haven't reflected that much. And Part of that, I mean, you can even see it on the field. Like, I'm not a huge celebrating person because for me, it's always like the next snap. And that's still right now where I am. It's just the next game. But the one thing this past week and that kind of made me reflect was I took my parents into the locker room, the uh, game day locker room, and they saw the play like a champion sign and those kind of things. And we took those just kind of pictures and stuff. And so I think it was really cool just to be able to have my whole family here and be able to just show them those kind of things and be able to kind of just take that moment to just be together and just enjoy Notre Dame for what Notre Dame has mm-hmm. done for me. That's great. I always ask you this. I know you've spoken about his leadership while he's here, but whenever he's done here, what, what excites you about the future for, for this guy? Man, it's, it's, I know he'll be successful. I know I say that often, but there's certain traits that, that guys possess um, that will create success no matter what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and he has the ability to play, this game of football for a long time. Um, but a lot of that is up to, to injuries and to what happens with your body and things like that. But whenever the game of football is done, if he takes the same approach, he will. Yeah. He will. To whatever his next chapter is, which is going to be being a husband and a father and, and whatever occupation that he chooses, he's going to be successful. He'll be running a company. He'll be doing something where – He's at the very top because he has that foundation, that work ethic uh, that it takes to have success. I'm looking forward to seeing what you do. When they're Thank you. Thanks for stopping by. Of course. Thanks to both you guys. We'll take a break. All right. Enough, enough good stuff. So nice. you. Enough good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. We are now joined by a very special guest this week. It is a man that I talk to every Saturday on the Notre Dame Football Radio Network broadcast. It's the voice of Notre Dame football in his sixth year, Paul Burmeister. Paul, I really appreciate you taking the time today. You're a busy man, so thank you for making some time for Wake Up the Echoes this week. Tony, this is really nice to be able to look down and see you because when I'm, I'm in the press box, I, I mean, I can't see you anywhere. I just hear you with, with the headphones on on Saturdays, uh, as you mentioned, when we chat. So this is a nice change to be uh, in my own house and to be able to look down and see you. I was going to say, too, I think over the next 15 or 20 minutes, we're going to have a chance to, frankly, interact even more than we do. Usually I'm teeing you up for you and Ryan to preview the game, and then you're throwing it back to me for the studio updates. So a chance to talk a little bit more dynamically about Notre Dame football, one of my favorite topics. I know one of your favorite topics. Picked a great week, 58-7, to seven, nine games in now. They feel like they are kind of figuring out what they are as a team. What are your impressions? You see them every week. Where do you think this team stands after nine games? I think the record is a, a pretty good indication. This is a team that is really, really, really good and just this close to being in that top five and in that conversation to be one of the teams that plays deep into January. I mean, they had their chances to be right there. Most teams can't say that, but two losses is disappointing on one hand. On the other hand, there are probably about 90% of the teams or more that would love to have that problem of being that close to being in the national championship conversation. So I think two loss team, that's a pretty good representative of a very good Notre Dame, Notre Dame team that we see right now. Obviously defense was the story this past week. They've been taking the ball away a ton. I think it's 10 takeaways in the last two weeks. I want to focus on offense though. I feel like they're also kind of slowly fall, finding their identity. If they had four pass catchers with 50 or more yards, that's more of what we expected to see from Sam Hartman. You obviously played the position, which I want to get into a little bit more later. What have you seen from Sam Hartman in this offense over the last couple of games that give you encouragement going into the final three? I think I'm going to back up a little bit to my, to my very first impression of seeing Sam in a Notre Dame uniform. And it was sometime early to mid-August. I came out to South Bend and, and spent a day watching camp. And I was, I was so excited to see him because, as you mentioned, I played the position many, many years ago. So I always kind of see things through that quarterback lens. And I wanted to watch a bunch of different positions, Tony, but I ended up watching Sam most of that afternoon that I was there. And what stood out to me was how much this is a quarterback who wants to hang in the pocket, maybe make one or two guys miss, not with like big moves or sprinting one way or the other, just kind of slight subtle little veteran savvy moves in the pocket and he doesn't want to like wow you with the fastball downfield or throw it 65 yards downfield what he really wants to do is use his instincts and feel and touch it to find someone 20 to 25 yards down the field on what i call a daring throw not a not a not a throw that is um that's an error or that's like you know what that's a poor decision but he likes to hang and he likes to try and fit one in and I see that all the time on Saturday. And sometimes guys like that throw interceptions. And we saw a couple of picks on Saturday. But most of the time, that quality, that that signature move of his, little move in the pocket, touch pass down the field, it usually works out with Notre Dame fans cheering and me making a big call that I'm excited about. So I noticed that in August, that he wants to make daring throws with his touch and his feel. And I love seeing that on Saturday. It's funny that you talk about not being able to look away from the position that you played. I talked to Marcus Freeman just an hour ago, and we had J.D. Bertrand here, and they agreed that he can look at the whole field, and in the end, he comes right back to linebacker, and he's always on the linebackers first. And it actually leads me to a question about the job you have now. You played quarterback in the Big Ten, back for Iowa in the 90s, and now you call the game. I listen to you call the game, and one of the things I'm going to point this out, that those who listen, they might notice this, those who don't should, when you're calling the game, I actually hear you point out the routes that are run more mm. than the average play-by-play. -play. And I think that's your quarterback experience coming through. How do you think being a quarterback at this level helped you transition into this job of calling Notre Dame games on the radio? I think, first of all, Tony, I appreciate that observation that, that you point that out uh, because I, I do like to be something beyond just um, someone who studied this and wasn't lucky enough to play it. I would hope that the fact that I was around it a lot playing shows up every now and then. Uh, so thank you for pointing that out. I think, first of all, playing quarterback helped me way back when I'm going to go back to, to when I first started at NFL Network. And I, I wasn't ready to be at that level. I was lucky enough to get thrown out there and have that opportunity. But I worked with a couple of guys named Sterling Sharp and Solomon Wilcox. 
And I think Sterling and Solomon gave me the benefit of the doubt that first season while I was kind of trying to find my footing on that level. They're like, this is a guy that played. He didn't play at the same level we played in the NFL for a long time, but he's a former Big Ten quarterback. We're going to start out liking him because of that and, and see if he can catch up. So I think my football background has helped me a number of times when I haven't done my job as well as I've wanted to, especially in the past. But analysts will start out, as I said, giving me that benefit of the doubt because they know I used to play. As for what I'm doing now with the play-by-play, -play, I'm so used to looking out at a defense and not just looking at the ball, but looking out and kind of seeing all 22 people. And I can't always lean on that because I need to give the, the, the listener, I was going to say viewer, I need to give the listener what he or she or what I think they are listening for. But I can zoom out of that a little bit and see the entire field, just like I used to, see what the defense is doing. And I think it helps with, with quick recognition. And you know very well, during the week, you want to study the names and numbers and have them down so well. So when you see something, it comes out really quickly. And I think the combination of prep, which I usually feel pretty good about with my football background, I would hope it allows the listener to hear things in time when they're supposed to hear them because I'm recognizing what's happening on the field. Yeah, I, I when I listen, I hear nine yard in route, I hear seam route. I don't hear that from a lot of play-by-plays and it's, it's super useful when you're listening to the game. I want to dig into your career a little bit more. You mentioned NFL Network. You, of course, worked now with NBC for, I think, close to a decade. You're doing the Notre Dame games on the radio, doing more play-by-play. -play. Take me back, though, to when you started, I guess maybe came out of college or whenever that fire started to burn that you wanted to get into broadcasting. How did you know you wanted to be in this line of work? And then what steps did you take to ultimately get that break at NFL Network that you alluded to earlier? So I was kind of wandering in my 20s, Tony. I was, I was a decent quarterback, as we talked about at Iowa. Uh, decent enough to, to have a chance to play in the NFL. I was with the Vikings as a free agent for a few months, but I wasn't good enough to make a career out of it. So here I am in my mid-20s, and I didn't really have a backup plan, which now as a parent, I, I, try to, I try to make sure that my sons have a little more of a backup plan than the old man did, uh, because I was, in, I was 24, 25, 26, really trying to find something that I really wanted to do that lit that fire, like you said, the, the way playing sports always did my whole life. And I was lucky enough, just because I played quarterback at Iowa and I had relationships uh, around some of the local news departments to get a chance at the ABC in Eastern Iowa. KCRG allowed me the chance to kind of learn the business and not just be on the air, but how to run the camera, how to cut the video, how to produce a sports cast, how to write it, how to plan out in between the six and the 10. What are you going to shoot? What are you not going to shoot? So I really learned how to be a, a local sportscaster. I don't want to say by accident because people gave me nice opportunities and I had to work at them, but I never had a class in college. I never thought about it right after college boy broadcasting something I want to do. I was around home looking for that something that made me want to work hard at it. And I was fortunate enough to find it in broadcasting. And Tony, you know this because you've done it as, at a high level too. The second that red light went on for the first time and I was on live TV, even though there weren't too many people watching back in Eastern Iowa on whatever evening that was, I felt nervous. I felt excited. I wanted to do really well. When I was done, I thought about what I did and didn't do. And that feeling definitely correlated to being an athlete and playing quarterback. There was a rush. Uh, there were nerves. There was excitement. And there was evaluation when I was done. You knew right away if it was good or not good. And I think that feeling, I think I recognized that inside myself. And that, because I played quarterback, led me to keep trying to be good at it. And here we are now, I, I guess, 20 or 25 years later. Such a unique path. It's great to hear. I want to ask about the six years now in this specific role, and then we'll broaden out and talk about uh, some of your other football assignments coming up this, these next few weeks. But Notre Dame, football on the radio. Obviously, NBC's had a long partnership with Notre Dame, so when the opportunity came up and, and you had a chance to be the football radio voice, what excited you about the job? And then what have you maybe learned in your six years about football radio play-by-play? -play? Notre Dame and just what has the experience been like to, to be around this team now for obviously two CFP runs and some really good football along the way as well it's just been really really fun Tony and I wish I had uh, some kind of sophisticated nuanced word or a, a descriptor beyond fun but it is really it's it's fun and when you think about sports on TV or sports on the radio and you're not in the business of course it looks like fun all the time you know, there are certain opportunities that that aren't as much fun as they look like. And when you're lucky enough to get one that 
getting ready for it feels good. There's an excitement and there's an anticipation uh, that, that's not just all nerves and angst, but it's really excitement for what's coming in that day when you're on the air. And then when you're doing it, it makes you smile. That's like, okay, I, I need to hang on to this. And I, I wasn't doing it very long, Tony, before I realized there's a reason people keep these radio jobs for 30, 40, 50 years, because they're really, really fun. It's great to have a connection to a team. If you're lucky enough to have a partner like I am with Ryan Harris, that you really enjoy their company. They're just kind of perfect weekends of, of talking ball and being on the air. So I, I, I'm not sure what your exact specific question was to send me down this road, <laughs> but here I am just thinking about I, I, I feel lucky to have a job in this business that is just fun to do. And I always look forward to coming back. You mentioned Ryan Harris. He was a guest on this show. I talked to him as well as you every Saturday. What do you like most about working with that guy? He is obviously extremely upbeat. Um, he seems like a blast to work with. What do you enjoy most about spending time with him? I think first of all, just just personally, Tony, once you get into a business that, that you are or a profession that you're really serious about and you like I've been married for a long time, I've had kids for a long time, like those things, job, marriage, being a parent, they take up all my time and they've taken up my time in a great way. I mean, th those are three wonderful parts of life. Uh, what I'm getting at, you don't have many chances as an adult to really make friends that are a lot of fun that you really connect with, that you get to spend time with because life doesn't present you those opportunities. You're either being a partner, being a dad, or, or trying to be good at your job. And th there's not much room for anything else. Ryan's somebody who is, uh, he, he's become a wonderful friend. We spent a lot of time together. We have a lot of laughs together. So I, I think it starts there that this is the, the rare opportunity as an adult, as, as a parent, as a professional, that I've made a true friend that I enjoy spending time with. So I, I think that's number one. Professionally, two things really stand out with Ryan uh, that I appreciate and understand and kind of recognize all the time. Number one, he's got something to say after every play. And that, that comes with the job requirement. A lot of people don't think much about that, but it's not automatic, no matter what sport you're doing, that you're going to have a partner that has an observation to share the entire time. Think about it. That's, that's over 100 observations per event, per game. That's hard to do. Yeah. Ryan will see something, whether you agree with him or not, he'll see something that sparks a thought and shares it. It's great. That's wonderful for me um, as a friend and as a pro. I see that and I love that. Number two, he's made me better at this because he's got such a, a, a fun personality that he's reminded me, and you'll understand this, Tony, it, in radio for the play-by-play -play guy, there's not as much time to interact with your partner because there's so much description. Mm -hmm. On TV, I, I'm just captioning what happened, and it's easy to interact with my analyst. On radio, I'm explaining, I'm explaining, I'm talking, I, I'm saying what happened and where the ball was, and there's just not that much time to hang out with the person you're there with. Ryan is so good at that part, and it, if I didn't pay attention to what he was saying, and if I didn't interact with him or make a point to interact with him, in addition to trying to articulate what's happening on the field, I'd be doing the audience a disservice because I wouldn't be getting the most out of one of my out of my guy who's really, really entertaining and fun. So he has pushed me to be not just a a, a fair and accurate play by play person on the radio, but someone who's interacting with a fun, bubbly dude, because I, I think the audience appreciates that. And he's he has really made me think about that. And tried to be good at good at that on the radio too. Yeah, his energy is is certainly uh, infectious. Uh, whether you work with yeah. him directly or even across the phone line, like I am. Right. Let's talk about another Notre Dame guy that's an analyst that you're going to be working with next couple of weeks. You're going to be on a couple of Peacock assignments with NBC doing Big Ten football. Uh, Kyle Rudolph, a guy I actually had a chance to work with on the spring game last year. I think that's you right. worked with him maybe USFL as yeah. well. Yeah. So he's kind of cutting his teeth now in this industry. I would never suggest. I think the game's at a different time as the Notre Dame game. So for Notre Dame fans, <laughs> take the new Notre Dame game on TV or the radio, and then jump over to watch Paul and Kyle there you go. next week. Where are you guys going to be? And then what's the experience been like working with or getting ready to work with Kyle to yeah. try to put him in a position to succeed? Obviously, in his first tour of duty here. I think that's a great shout out because I believe right when Notre Dame is over, right when you go off the air, I think Iowa Northwestern comes on at the exact same time. So. Perfect. I mean, that could be a pretty good way for people to spend their Saturday. Uh, but it's the Hawkeyes and the Wildcats. It's, it's pretty cool, Tony. It's going to be played at Wrigley Field. And that is, uh, I think it's going to be a challenge logistically to set up. And I, I don't know how the teams feel about playing there. But I grew up in Iowa City, Iowa. 
my dad, because of radio, he grew up on a farm that the one sporting event they could get Cubs baseball. So he was a diehard Cubs fan. Every summer he would drive me and my sisters to Wrigley Field. Fantastic memories. So when I got asked by my boss at NBC to call a football game at Wrigley Field, I mean, I, I raised both hands and said, that's that's pretty cool for me. So, so number one, personally, it's going to be special for me. But as for Kyle, as you mentioned, I had a chance to work with him in the USFL. And you saw this as well when you worked with him. He's easy company. He's a good guy. This is something he really wants to be good at. Uh, he's nice to everybody. And those are, again, you, you may not think about those things as as special or extra, but when you work in this business, you don't always get someone who checks all those boxes. Uh, a lot of people who are fresh off the field, they're, they're stunned by how much work it is, uh, by how difficult it is to be that quick in, in the moment with all that pressure. And it's not really something that they want to do eventually. And you can feel that when you're working next to them. When I was with Kyle, he, he, he brought preparation. He brought a smile and some energy. And it's just something that I know he wants to do. So he's new at it. And when we're all new at it, there are plenty of things to think about it that you want to get better at. But to me, he starts with, with a, a commitment to this business. Uh, his preparation is good and he's fun to hang out with. So pretty good place to start. We'll see where it goes the next couple of weeks. All right. I'll be looking to, looking forward to watching that when I'm done with the game down in Clemson, catching you guys on the, on the car go. ride back. Last one I've got before we take our break, before our From the Irish question is about your son. Mm -hmm. Ben, I believe, is yeah. committed to play lacrosse here. He'd come in next season. So obviously, I think this, this announced, I think last year, congratulations. That's such a neat accomplishment for him. What excites you about the prospect of being a Notre Dame dad? And just how thrilled are you that your son's going to be in South Bend going forward the next few years? Yeah, I'm mostly, Tony. Ben, first of all, thank you for bringing it up. It's a pretty cool topic for me to discuss. But I'm mostly just happy that he found what he was looking for. And for all of us parents, when your kid gets to the point when they're thinking about college, it's a giant, big old kind of scary world to think about and consider. And you, you start to think back about all the positives and negatives that, that can happen in a college experience. You just want them to find a place that feels good to them. So I'm super excited that he found that place, both academically and athletically, at a wonderful spot like Notre Dame. And as it kind of came down the home stretch last fall, and Notre Dame was in the final two, three, four schools that he was going to pick from. I, I, I felt myself all at once being very excited about the prospect of coming to work in South Bend and having my son there and getting to take him out to dinner and get, getting to meet his friends and those kind of things. And at the same time, Tony, I pulled back and I'm like, you cannot uh, put any of that on him because he right. needs to make a choice where he wants to be based off of where he wants to be, not because dad's going to be excited. So I tried to stay in the background and just say, buddy, wherever you want to go is awesome. High five. Mom and I will support you. And when he said he was going to Notre Dame, obviously I started to think about, man, oh man, seven weekends in the fall, I'm going to come to South Bend and get to spend that time with him. So I feel extremely lucky that that program and academically Notre Dame is that good and my son gets to be there. And just the, the, the giant bonus is the extra time that I'm going to get to spend with him. Well, I'm sure that'll be fun in the fall. Also, you get a chance to come back and check them out in the spring, too, when they're playing, which will be great as well. Let's take a quick break, Paul, and we'll come back with our From the Irish question. All right, it's time now for our From the Irish question presented by TireRack.com. Still here with Paul Burmeister. Paul, it's a question that I think a lot of people are interested in. It's timely because of what you have coming up this weekend at Wrigley and then, of course, your duties throughout the year. As the radio voice, it comes from Andrew from Alita, Ohio. He says, what makes calling a game on the radio different from calling it on TV? I think uh, it's a great question. It's one to think about all the time. I mean, six seasons in, Tony, that there are enough differences. I think about it to, to remind myself every single time I go on the air because it is so much different. Mike Tirico said it to me best. I, I was lucky enough when I got the job, I didn't really have any radio experience. I talked to a number of people who I knew kind of toggled between TV and radio, either all the time or at some point in their career. Uh, Ian Eagle was a wonderful help. Mike Tirico, of course, was a great help. And Mike's like, Paul, you got to keep in mind when you're on the radio, that story time that you're used to on TV in between plays where you can get into a story, that's description time. It's not time for a story. It's not time for a connecting anecdote. It's time to say he spun out of that tackle. He put his right hand down. He, he went to the left. 
There's so much description that has to be done. You have to get out of, or I have to get out what I'm so used to on TV. And that's a little bit of story connector and turn that into description time. So that's number one, which leads into number two, which is on TV, the pictures, the analyst, the producer, the game, that takes front and center stage. And I want to be in the background kind of connecting dots, making sense of it, captioning all the play that I see, but let everything else take center stage. On the radio, and you know this as a play-by-play -play person, it is mostly you. And that's that's not my normal personality on the air. I had, I had to teach myself that it's okay that I'm talking more than Ryan. Uh, the audience expects that and needs that based off of job roles. So I think story time becoming description time and just getting okay with talking so much, so much more than I do on TV are the two biggest things. That's that's a great, two great notes. I think that anybody listening, trying to get into broadcasting can definitely put to practice. Uh, and it's great to hear you echo those. Paul Burmeister, I uh, can't thank you enough for doing this. Always great to talk to you. Glad we got to interact more than our normal exchanges. Uh, I'm looking forward to watching you at Wrigley. That does sound, especially after what you mentioned about your dad, uh, like an awesome opportunity, not just to call your alma mater, but be in a special place. So, We'll make sure to watch you after we take in the Notre Dame game at noon this weekend, and then we'll hear you on the radio a couple weeks later calling the game again. Our days are switched, Tony, because I will listen to you before I go on the air on Saturday at Wrigley, and then you can take the headset off and hopefully check out Iowa Northwestern. So uh, have a good one on Saturday. I know you will, and thanks for having me. That does it for this week's edition of Wake Up the Echoes, presented by TireRack.com. Thanks again to the head coach, Marcus Freeman, Jade Mickey, J.D. Bertrand, and, of course, Paul Burmeister for joining us on this week's show. Have no fear. Even though it's a bye week next week, we are back with Coach Freeman and company for another football show. That'll be our ninth and penultimate football show of the year. And then after that, we're going to start transitioning into basketball. Both men's and women's will be featured on this show. Coach Micah Shrewsbury and Neil Ivey will both be in the hot seat with me. Can't wait to talk to them as they get set for the 23 24 seasons. In the meantime, download on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasting content. Make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube, and please drop a comment if you have some feedback. Also, don't forget to submit your questions for our special guests every week. We look forward to talking to you every week, and until next week, let's wake up the echoes.